Ready? Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Media Lab conversation series. This one is a little bit unique in that it's part of a class on awareness that uh, Tenzin and I are teaching. So many of our students are here. And just for the people in the audience, we're going to be streaming this. Uh, and we will be uh, looking for questions on Twitter. So if you send tweets to and put the hashtag ML Talks, we will be uh, tracking that. So generally, the format for these conversation series talks are uh, a presentation by a speaker at the beginning, then a conversation with me, and then we, in we involve um, the audience uh, later. But today, I wanted to actually have uh, Tenzin, who is the, let me make sure I don't get this wrong, Dala, who's the director of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values. Uh, he and I are uh, teaching a course on awareness together, but he uh, uh, does a lot of uh, speaking and, and, and working both at MIT and, and in the world. Uh, he was originally going to be part of the conversation, but he has an important visitor from out of town that he has to attend to. So he's going to leave um, after he introduces our speaker. So Tenzin. Thank you, Joy. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Media Lab Conversations. Um, I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, a dear friend and learning scholar, Alan Wallace. Um, who's, uh, among many things, uh, he's uh, heading something called the Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Studies. Um, uh, in the realm of science, especially in the realm of science at MIT, uh, oftentimes we don't touch subjects like consciousness, awareness. In fact, for most times, we don't even touch subjects like, who am I? What am I doing? Where am I going? So these are some of the parts of uh, our conversations today that uh, Joey will be moderating. And as Joey mentioned, this is part of a course called Principles of Awareness, where we are sort of exploring what does it mean to be an aware being, an aware individual. And Alan comes to us from a very interesting background. Uh, he's a Buddhist studies scholar, but also a religious studies scholar, but also uh, did his academic work in physics as well. So he has perspective on uh, both disciplines. And beyond that, he has been interacting with uh, some very renowned, learned individuals. And so he'll be bringing all of that perspective uh, to us this afternoon. So thank you again for joining us, Alan. Thank you, Tenzin. I will be your listener while you speak. <laughs> <laughs> So why don't you start by giving us a, some of your thoughts to kick us off. Um, and you can talk for a little while, and then we can start the conversation. I should share simply yeah. some of my thoughts. <laughs> I have many. I've got plenty to spare. <laughs> but we're addressing, of course, a very central aspect of reality, core to our very existence here as sentient beings, the nature of awareness. One of the few elements of the natural world that have been studied to some extent for which there seems to be no scientific consensus whatsoever about many functions of the brain, of the mind, and of course the external, physical, quantifiable, objective world, an enormous body of consensual knowledge gained over the last four centuries since Galileo. But when you come right to our essence, what is it that defines us as sentient beings and among sentient beings our humanness to overlook consciousness to overlook awareness uh, is overlooking something very essential. So my own approach to this topic is one in the spirit of William James, who's one of my intellectual heroes. Uh, my approach is one of a radical empiricism to try to approach it with uh, a lot of use of Occam's razor, because I think there's a lot of beards growing in scientific, philosophical, and religious discourse about the nature of awareness, consciousness, soul, so many assumptions built in that sometimes it's hard to clear it out and see what's there prior to and independent of our many religious, philosophical, materialistic assumptions that we can bring to bear. So I just, when I was downstairs just entering here at the Medium Lab, I had a couple of minutes to spare before my host came down and picked me up. And I saw the little placard there uh, in a tribute to Marvin Minsky. And there was a quote that caught my attention because I agreed with everything he said. 
although I disagree with other points, of course, and that was, I think I can quote him verbatim, at least very close paraphrase, he said, there's never, there, no computer has ever been designed to ever be aware of what it, do, of what it does. For the most part, for the most, most of the time, we aren't either. Shall I say it again? It's a good one. No computer has ever been designed to be aware of what it does. Most of the time, we aren't either. I think it's very cogent. To speak of computer awareness is to speak in the realm of imagination, but without empirical basis. Because since scientifically, thus far, unless something happened yesterday that I'm not, not aware of, we have no scientific objective measuring device to actually be able to detect the presence of awareness or consciousness in anything. And it would be very cool if we did, if we just go on a little bit of a tangent here, the whole pro-life, pro-choice debate, I think is debated on both sides by very, de by very decent, in many cases, compassionate, conscientious people, morally arguing for position they believe in. But of course, the whole debate is, is taking place in a morass of ignorance. Because at what point in the, in, the, in the mother's womb, at what point is this basically a body part, like a kidney, that she can give away and should not have to consult at anybody? It's a kidney, it's a body part. And at what point is a passenger? A conductor of a train does not have the legal right just to throw out people if he just doesn't like them or if they're inconvenient or for whatever reason. Can't do that because they're sentient beings. Even a dog, you can't just throw out the window if you're, if you're you know, taking care of a train. So what is it, a body part or a, or a passenger? Well, I would think we all agree that, a, that, that an egg is a body part. You can sell it, freeze it, dry it, eat it if you like, but it's a body part. And likewise, the main sperm, do whatever you like with it, it's yours. At some point, and I don't pretend to know when, with the union of egg and sperm, at some point, whether it's simultaneous, as the Roman Catholics believe, a month later, a, tri a trimester later, three months, six months, whenever, at some point, there's a passenger there, right? It's two beings, one is inside the body of the other one, in which case, even if we regard it as an animal, and why not in its earlier phases, at least something that is proto-human, one would think it must have some rights. Animals have rights. So at what point does the passenger have some right? Well, all I'm getting at is not to argue a position one way or another, I'm simply arguing that it would be so much in the clear, there would be much clearer common ground of what we're actually debating about if there was some scientific way of measuring. When is the body part no longer a body part? When is it a passenger? So consciousness, we have no scientific means of observing it, no scientific definition. I think there are about 50 floating around. There's no consensus whatsoever. Don't know what causes it. Don't know really what happens at death because if you can't define it, can't measure it, and you don't know what causes it, you don't know what happens at death either. We have a lot of beliefs and they may be supported by a lot of evidence, but nevertheless, it's a belief. So what I'd like to do here for a couple of minutes is simply say, well, can we, can we define it phenomenologically? Can we define consciousness, our own awareness, which we do know intimately from a first-person perspective? Can we define it? And I'm gonna to try to do that. And the source of this is Buddhist phenomenology. So not metaphysics, not religious belief, not dogma. But just when we look right into our own experience of being aware, what are the salient characteristics of being aware that come to our attention? Here's one of them, try it on for size. And that is right now as I gaze out at you here in the audience and, and all these cameras, a lot of appearances are rising. I'm seeing colors, I'm sh I can hear my own voice, I can feel the tactile sensations throughout my body. Right, hear background noise. And so appearances are arising, lots of them. A lot of background ambient noise here, I think we're all aware, right? And so what is it that's making the appearances, philosophers call it the qualia, the qualia of these immediate sense impressions that we are all experiencing right now? What's, what's making that possible? Any neuroscientist, any decent physicist will tell you the sounds that we are hearing are not traveling through, through the air. Sound waves, yes. The sounds that we hear, no. They arise independent upon auditory cortex, right? Likewise, colors are not, tra are not traveling through the air, smacking, getting, hitting a smack dab in the, in the retina. Photons, electromagnetic fields, whatever model you like, that's what's traveling through the air. So what is it that is actually enabling appearances to arise? They clearly, as in the case of visual impressions, arise independent upon visual, visual cortex. Independence 
fun prior to that, a whole series of electrochemical events starting with the retina and of course photons out in, the, in space. But what is it that enables it? Because the neurons don't become red, yellow, green, blue. The notion of colors actually emerging from neurons if we just kind of reboot and throw out all of our assumptions, use Occam's razor right down to the skin, does it really make any sense to think that smells are emerging from neurons? That colors are emerging from neurons? Let alone that neurons are actually turning purple or light blue when I look at this, this placard here? Doesn't really make any sense, does it? Either that they turn blue or that blue and blueness is the quality of somehow magically lofting off like, like mist off of a lake that they're somehow coming out of. It strikes me as about as reasonable as thinking if you rub a lamp a genie will pop out. There's no evidence for it. So what's making them? If it's not neurons, if it's not photons, what is creating the appearances themselves? Of course they arise independence upon the brain that's not, contest, not contested here. Where are they coming from? And an obvious one will be, why don't you just take the obvious candidate, consciousness. Consciousness makes for appearances. Consciousness illuminates the quality of the five physical senses. But not only that, we're gonna go into dreaming a little bit later. What's the source of illumination? Of all the colors, the brightness, the sounds, the smells, the tastes and so forth you experience in a dream. What's manifesting all those appearances? A friend of mine recently had a dream, it was a lucid dream, and it was so bright that he had to put on sunglasses inside the dream. Cool, yeah? Why? So he's putting on dream sunglasses to protect retina that don't exist, because you, know, you, you don't have a physical head inside the dream, and you don't have any photons striking your retina from a non-existent sun, and so exactly where is that brightness coming from that actually you can dim it when you put on dream sunglasses? Okay, how about consciousness? This is a quality of consciousness. It's not a quality of computers. Computers by themselves, my cell phone or whatever, they don't create appearances. Look at them and appearances arise. But a computer doesn't create or generate appearances. So there's one. Consciousness illuminates. It illuminates not only our sensory impressions, but also are you aware of your emotions from moment to moment? Are you aware of whether your mind is active, whether it's dull, whether it's conceptually agitated, or whether it's quiescent? Whether you're bored, whether you're interested, whether you're happy, sad, fearful, or sanguine, and so forth, I think we are, right? We all know that. What is it that is illuminating our own first person experience to ourselves? How about consciousness? Because you can actually observe it happening. So on the one hand, as I'm gazing out again, I'm getting these sensory impressions arising, shapes and colors, shapes and colors, but something more is taking place. And that is, I, I, as I gaze at your sweater, I'm not only getting the quality, I'm not only getting the grayness appearing, but I also know you're wearing a sweater. You're not naked, you're not wearing a, a sport, sports jacket. I'm looking and there's a knowing there, a knowing, right? I know that the square root of mi minus one is what's an imaginary number, isn't it? Square root of minus one, I know that. Not much comes to mind. Not much in the way of imagery, except for maybe the little, you know, the symbol comes to mind, but I know that. I know that the square root of 64 is, okay, eight, but I don't need much imagery for that. So there is knowing that is not the same as simply appearances arising. Sometimes the cognizance doesn't have much of an appearance quality to it. Sometimes there's a lot of appearance, but not a whole lot of knowing. Like I saw something, but I'm not quite sure what it was, you know? So how about those two? Maybe I'm finished. If consciousness has its defining characteristics, the quality of illuminating, making manifest appearances, and the quality of cognizance, of actually knowing. Consciousness has that. Anything that is consciousness, conscious has those qualities, and anything that isn't, doesn't. We come back to Marvin Minsky's statement, though, and that is a computer is never aware of what it's doing. It's not designed as such. Who would know how to design it when you can't scientifically measure the presence or absence of consciousness, let alone how much consciousness, then the notion of, oh, Mar uh, Michael Gra uh, Graziano, the neuroscientist from Princeton in a recent article in the New York Times, saying you can program a silicon chip to be aware. I say, well, that's a very nice fantasy. Where's your evidence? You can't measure it, so how would you know whether you've programmed it successfully or not? So it seems to be an utterly vacuous statement by a person who is a neuroscientist. So, I mean, if it's poetry, it's poetry. But when he goes on to say that we have no subjective impressions at all, that's why there's no mind-body pr mind problem. 
And a physicist of the distinction of Michio Kaku saying the same thing, Daniel Dennett, distinguished philosopher saying the same thing. I'm wondering, this is the greatest insult you can possibly give to a sentient being, is you're not sentient, and you expect them to listen to you. There should be laughter right there. If they've heard you, they've refuted you. So I'm gonna throw that one out. It's so absurd that it doesn't even deserve a response because if you respond, you've already proven that he's wrong. So here, the mind-body mind problem is present. It doesn't go away. Computers, as far as we know, have never been designed to be conscious, and they don't even know the first step on how to make them conscious, and if they did, they wouldn't know whether they've succeeded. So this is Occam's razor. Let's just trim it back and say, all right, well, why don't we be absurd for just a moment? Am I aware that of any of you being conscious? Because I can't measure your conscious. Maybe you're a whole bunch of mannequins or zombies or what have you. And I'm gonna throw that one out really quickly. My parents were both conscious, I'm their kid, we're all the same species, similar brains, so I know I'm conscious, you look a lot like me, so I'm finished. And then other creatures, if we go to primates and then dogs and lizards and caterpillars, we get down to single cell organisms and I get very hazy very quickly. I don't know where the cutoff is, but I know I'm conscious, and in fact, that's the most indubitable knowledge I have. I won't even use the word I like Descartes does. I won't, because I'm, I'm not quite sure what the reference of that is. I am conscious, therefore, I will just simply say consciousness happens. Consciousness is being experienced, which is actually redundant, because it's not consciousness, it's not being experienced. But I say that's our most indubitable knowing, our knowing of knowing, our awareness of being aware. We could all be dreaming right now, in principle. I could be home asleep in Santa Barbara right now and dreaming that I came to the illustrious MIT and speaking before an August community and it's all gonna go on Twitter or something. But you know, and then I wake up, oh, Alan, you were dreaming. You know, it could be, that's possible in principle. It's not inconceivable, right, not irrational. But the notion that I'm not aware at all, that awareness is not taking place at all, is the most irrational premise one can possibly make. So a computer hasn't been, maybe never will be designed to be conscious, and most of the time we aren't either. And of course, I think what Marvin Minsky was getting at is not that we're absolutely unconscious, but perhaps that we could become a lot more so. And that's what meditation is about. I'm speaking from the Buddhist tradition. A central theme, it's not the only one, but it is certainly core, is that we are to some, some extent conscious, indisputably. But can we become more so? For the five physical senses, for our consciousness of the objective, physical, quantifiable world, uh, the natural sciences have received 400 years of applause for extending our consciousness, our awareness, our knowing of what's taking place objectively, physically, and quantifiably in the world around us, including now the world around us being our own brains. But what about our own subjective experience? for which everything you're thinking, feeling, sensing, desiring, and so forth, all of your subjective experience without exception is all invisible to every instrument of technology. Brain correlates, yes, of course. Behavioral expressions, yes, of course. But my hero William James said, as a pioneer of modern cognitive science, he said, you know, when it comes to studying the mind, if by this you mean our subjective experience, and not simply reducing it to behavior, as John Watson and company did, not simply reducing it to neurophysiological activity, as many, many neuroscientists, people in the artificial intelligence do, if you're actually willing to take the bull by the horns and say, no, when I mean mind, I mean what we actually experience as our own minds from a first-person perspective. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, perceptions, attention, and so forth, and dreams, then we have a domain of reality here that is invisible, once again, to all instruments of observation, objectively, which is what science is good at. But there's hope. We are already aware, to some extent, from a first-person perspective, of our own mental states, processes, and so forth. So since that's our only avenue, that's the only mind we can actually observe, then why not do it better? And that, remarkably, since the time of William James, who emphasizes so strongly and eloquently, from my perspective, and I've been watching this fairly closely for the last 30 years or so, in terms of the refinement of metacognitive awareness, not just leaving this at the level of folk psychology, just like folk astronomy was called astrology, where you just look up in the sky and say, wow, 4,000 bright star, you know, little bright spots, sun and moon, a whole bunch of bright spots, 4,000 of them, wow, isn't it beautiful, this adornment for our planet. You know, that's folk, psycho that's folk astronomy, we call astrology. But that's exactly where we are in the year 2014, after about 135 years of the cognitive sciences. As far as I can tell, there's actually been no progress at all 
in refining, making sophisticated, making rigorous are one empirical avenue to making actual observations of mental states, states of consciousness, mental process, and so forth, including dreams. This is an area that's an enormous weakness to the point of like non-existence in modern cognitive science. I, I studied cognitive psychology when I was at Stanford. I find it quite remarkable in the preface uh, there, were, there were allusions to introspection as a phase of modern psychology that didn't work, and therefore we're not going to try that anymore, and then went on to the whole study of the mind irrespective of, independent of, completely dismisses, uh, dismissive of introspection. To my mind, that makes about as much sense as, as trying, trying to start a new, a new uh, let's say, discipline of astronomy, but banning telescopes. So, is there anybody on the planet who is actually good at this? has developed refined methods for investigating, probing into exploring the nature of the mind, possibly even multiple dimensions of consciousness, exploring dream states, even exploring dreamless sleep. Any, any since science hasn't, really has made basically no progress at all. And I would, I would say, well, the answer is yes. Contemplative traditions all over the world, early Christianity, the Kabbalah, the Sufi tradition in the, among the Abrahamic religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, it's a strength. So this is not competition. I'll, I'll just now speak from Buddhist perspective. Buddhism has no neuroscience at all, no quantitative behavioral science at all, so there's no competition. What it really is is complementarity. So let's just take this, this one point. We're already aware to some extent of our own mental processes, states of consciousness, and so forth. Is it possible to become more aware with greater precision, greater sophistication, reliability, and when we make actual discoveries, might they be replicable? Because this is one of the, the, the problems, the challenges in trying to introduce introspection or the first person perspective into the scientific study of the mind is that first person experience is private. So if I tell you I just witnessed a certain thought or an emotion or I had this dream last night, how on earth would you know whether I'm telling you the truth, whether I'm lying, I'm simply mistaken or I'm misinterpreting. There's all kinds of variations there. And since it's, it's private, it's subjective, doesn't that kind of leave everybody else in the dark? The answer is yes, but it doesn't have to be. And that is, let's take another very subjective discipline. Mathematics. Foundation of all of the sciences, right? Mathematics, the language of nature. When mathematics, or when mathematicians, when they are seeking to develop a proof of a certain theorem, they often do it on their own. They write it all out. And then at some point, and I learned this when I was studying calculus at, at Amherst, advanced calculus, at some point the proof happens. At some point you have that decisive moment, that epiphany of knowing something, and you know all of this logical steps that got you there. And then you say QED, okay? That's subjective, it's entirely subjective. How would anybody know? But the answer is they do. You show your, your proof to other people, and they will take it step by step if they're highly trained, and they will or will not come to the same conclusion, right? So if you have a community of mathematicians who are not brainwashed, but they're simply given the same discipline, the same training, so that the really top people, the field medal, the field, field medal, yes? The, the recipients of field medal, that, that's by meritocracy. People know who the top-notch mathematicians are. That among highly trained mathematicians, there is in fact a lot of intersubjective truth. A lot of discoveries have been made, each one private, but they are replic replicated, and then through their discourse, through knowing each other, they can tell who the really good mathematicians are. They can tell. If I were a brilliant mathematician, I came up with a new proof, and you tell me you've understood it, then I could interrogate you, and I could see by speaking with you whether you really got it or not. It's true, isn't it? So it's subjective, and yet it is also intersubjective. So here's an ability the ability to observe in a rather objective way, ironically, and that is to sit quietly, let your awareness be very still, and then simply observe what thoughts, images, memories, fantasies, desires, emotions are coming up, and seek to be wholly present with them in this discerning, intelligent fashion. And then, what happens if you do that for 5,000 hours? Maybe 10 hours a day. I did a six-month solitary retreat last year, 12 hours a day. So it gets interesting. You do something 12 hours a day for six months, it's not like doing it for 20 minutes a day. So things settle. 
and insights start to come, discoveries start to be made. And if other people have also spent six months or six years or 20, 40 years in comparable research, first person investigating the nature of the mind, lo and behold, you start coming out with some intersubjective, replicable discoveries that can be made. And again, it's not a matter of discover. it's not a matter of competition. It's not allowed the religious people or the contemplatives win and the scientists have egg on their face at all. It's complete complementarity. So I've spoken before neuroscientists all over the place, including here twice at MIT. And I've asked them, when you're doing your neuroscientific studies, studying the neural correlates of subjective experience, would it be to your advantage or would it be not, not to your advantage, if among the people you had to the lab were not simply ordinary people called off the street or people with psychological disorders or people brain damaged, but if you could call into the lab to hook up with your EEG or put into the magnet and the M M and MRI, if you could call in people who'd put in 10, 20, 30,000 hours of training. So when you ask them to visualize something, and please hold that visualization for a minute, in contrast to seven seconds, which is what Stephen Coslin said, you max out at seven seconds. That's for Harvard undergraduates. They can actually hold it for a minute. Now generate this emotion, please. And now generate this memory. And now generate this. If you could actually have highly trained contemplatives in the lab, they're doing things the neuroscientists can't do. See, there's no competition here. The contemplatives are not vying to, you know, get the tenure, tenure track position in neuroscience, but the neuroscientists don't have this training either. So I see this as very fruitful grounds for interdisciplinary collaborative research. We get professionals on both sides. So you're not just studying the brains and behavior of meditators, which, char which characterizes almost every single study done of meditation thus far, but actually bring professionals together with professionals. So in this way, rather than simply identifying with the thoughts, the emotions, desires, and so forth that come up, I'm thinking this, I remember that, I'm feeling that, and so forth, rather than simply this cognitive fusion with every mental state and process that takes place, you are at rest clearly, objectively, and discerningly aware of whatever arises in the mind. In other words, within this subjective domain, you have a certain degree of objectivity. Might that be useful? So that you become more and more lucid, that is, knowing with respect to what's happening in your mind, rather than being, as Marvin Minsky said, most of the time not conscious or quasi-conscious, caught up in our rumination, our wandering thoughts, and so forth, and going through life as a quasi-zombie. I'll finish on one final point, and that is a juicy one I think we'll have some good conversation on. If Marvin Minsky is right that most of the time we're not conscious, or let's say we're semi-conscious, let's say non-lucid, we're not entirely oblivious, we're not entirely unconscious, but not clearly cognizant of what's taking place, especially in our own minds. If it's possible to become more lucid, knowing about the emotions that arise before we act on them, as my dear friend Paul Ekman, a very renowned affective psychologist said, be between the spark and the flame, between the spark of an emotion arising in your mind and the flame of behavior being expressed from that emotion, if you can be aware of the spark before it manifests in the flame, then you may avoid some regrettable episodes. Well, good idea, I think, yeah? We don't have to follow every desire, we don't have to follow every thought, but, if, but only if we're aware of them will we become lucid. Now let's go into the nighttime. Most of our dreams, most of the time, are non-lucid, and that is when the dream first begins, we're not aware, we're unaware that we've begun dreaming, and in that unawareness, unawareness is very fertile ground for delusion for misapprehending reality, and that's just a universal truth. In the first moment of a, of a dream, if we're not aware, in the second moment, we'll probably misapprehend it for something that is not. Namely, if people are appearing in your dream, you think, that's a person. That's my enemy, that's my friend, that's a mountain, this is, this is the office, and so forth. In other words, all of this is a pure creation of your own mind, but you, not recognizing that, mistake it for something that is not. And that is, these are real people out there, and they are a threat they might be helpful and so forth, and then we're emotionally reacting with the whole bandwidth of emotions we have in the waking state. We're quite helpless in that quasi-conscious state. We're not unconscious, we're aware of the events in the dream, but we're unconscious that they are events in a dream, which makes us very vulnerable, and we're acting largely out of habit. Well, many of you know from your own experience, can I ask for a show of hands, I'm, I'm always curious, how many of you had at least one lucid dream in your life where you're dreaming and you know you're dreaming? Standard, more than half. I do ask that question a lot. And in a wide variety of venues, first time at MIT, more than half, more than half. So you know what it's like. 
And you know when you become aware that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, that suddenly you have a broader bandwidth of freedom. You're now not simply the victim of the people, circumstances, events, and so forth taking place in your dream, but being aware that it is a dream, number one, there's often a sense of euphoria, I've had lucid dreams also, kind of a sense of well-being, a kind of euphoria that comes with that, kind of a thrill and exc excitement, but also there's a bandwidth of how lucid are you. So when I had one of my earliest lucid dreams, I got so excited, so thrilled, that wow, I've only had one of these before and it was really short, this is my second one, this has a real narrative. So I was in a diner in my dream, and I was a real evangelist. Not for Buddhism or any religion, I was an evangelist. I went from one person to another in the diner, all of them hunching down over the hamburgers and french fries. And he said, do you know this is a dream? Do you know this is a dream? I went from one to another, do you know this is a dream? I really wanted everybody to wake up. You know, not a single person would give me any attention at all. They just wanted the hamburgers and fries. They wouldn't even say, you know, buzz off, or you're stupid, or I agree with you, or I don't agree. No response. I was disappointed, because I thought this was the coolest thing that was happening, and everybody else thought hamburgers were cooler. Right? And so that's an interesting point though, isn't it? In this, again, from, from Marvin Minsky, the, you never see the society of your mind more vividly than when you're having a lucid dream. And what's so odd about it is you know that everything here is a manifestation of your own mind, but you also find out very quickly, as I did in that dream, that you can't predict the, the behavior of the other people in the dream. I would have expected more of a response than that, than no response at all. And we don't know how people will behave in our own dreams, in this society of the mind. Now, I'll say that in, in closing, a lucid dream, I say, is the optimal lab for the scientific, radically empirical study of the mind. Just as the physics laboratories, I'm sure you have many here at MIT, they have a big advantage, those physics laboratories. Everything in the laboratory is made out of physical stuff. So in, in principle, you could just throw rocks off the walls and you can still do some physical experiments. Because everything's physical, your body's physical too. So all of your interactions in the lab, it's perfect for a physics lab, because everything is physical. When you're in a lucid dream, everything is mental. In fact, there's nothing physical at all in the dream. And you know who demonstrated that? MIT's own Richard Feynman, when he was an undergraduate here many, many years ago, he had to take a course, he took a course in psychology, he had to do a research project, and he, just, and he was naturally gifted in lucid dreaming. So what he really loved was physics, he wasn't interested in psychology, I don't think much at all. So what did he do? He just waited until he had his next lucid dream, and then he ran physics experiments in his lucid dream to see whether the basic laws of science, mechanics, Newton, we're still operative in a dream. Well, all of you have had lucid dreams, and probably many of you have, who have not already know the answer. Have any of you flown in a dream? Sure, it's one of the funnest things and easiest things to do. Well, then you know already. The laws of physics do not apply to a dream. Therefore, isn't this one-step logic? Therefore, everything that play, takes place in a dream is not physical. Otherwise, the laws of physics would have to apply, and they don't. So dreams are non-physical. But if nighttime dreams are not physical, so are your daydreams not physical. Because they have no physical attributes. And when you try to observe them physically, you can't. That seems to be a pretty tight argument that dreams are not physical. Insofar as you become lucid, because there's a whole gradient, how lucid, how lucid, can you walk through walls, can you breathe underwater, where there's no less air underwater than there is air above water, because there's no air in the dream at all, and so forth. You're, you're expanding degrees of, of freedom. You are freer and freer the more clearly, accurately, and deeply you understand the nature of reality you're experiencing, right? Now, that gives you a very clear sense of the or a way to explore the luminous quality or the illuminating quality of consciousness. Because every appearance you're picking up, including your own emotions and desires within the dream, they're all illuminated by consciousness. Now, of course, independence upon the brain but they're illuminated by consciousness, right? But now, how about sheer cognizance? Because you also, you also know things happening, taking place in the dream. But like a run of, uh, next time you're having a lucid dream, might, 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 you might want to run a, a, a simple experiment. It's very easy and very quick. You're in the midst of a, non, of a lucid dream, and now just stop. Stop doing anything. In fact, you may as well close your eyes in the dream. Within seconds, I can pretty well guarantee you, the whole dreamscape will vanish out of sight, out of mind, out of existence. The dream isn't waiting for you someplace. When you close your eyes, 
There's nothing there waiting for you that when you open up your eyes again, it's there again. It's gone. It doesn't exist anywhere. So what happens? You're lucid. Imagine you're brilliantly lucid, clear, cognizant, bright, intelligent in your lucid dream. You close your eyes and then you're suddenly in a vacuum, a vacuum, an open vacuity. But you're still lucid. So now you're in not stage four non-REM sleep, dreamless sleep, but you're still lucid. You're cognizant, you know you're in a state of dreamless sleep, but in terms of appearances, pretty much nothing, a sheer vacuity. So if you'd like to explore the nature of consciousness, bare bones, unadorned, raw, naked, that's what you get when you're in deep dreamless sleep. It's not filtered, it's not adorned with the appearances of the five physical senses, it's not adorned with all the thoughts and imagery you have in the waking state or in the dream state. It's just naked, raw awareness itself. That can be quite insightful. So the parallels between lucid dreaming and lucid waking state, both to be cultivated through rigorous meditative training, is I think a topic that is very juicy. And maybe we'll start now with a conversation. Thank you, Alan. That was very interesting. Um, I, I know I'm probably channeling my students a little bit because um, we talk about lucid dreaming. I'm sure. But just first, a simple question, nature or nurture? So you said a little more than half of the people here have had it happen. Mm -hmm. um, can you train to do it? How much of it is how you're wired and how you're born? How much of it is mm -hmm. what you do? And it's, it sounds like fun. Um, I know um, one of our friends who actually says he spends about a third of his dream time working in yeah, his lucid right. dream, which uh -huh. seems um, a little bit boring. But, he doesn't um, get paid overtime too, does he? <laughs> but, but, I mean, do you, do you study lucid dreaming and the induction of lucid dreaming? Or is that, is that a thing? I do. Nature and nurture, you know, I don't think it's all that different from, well, it's mathematics. Uh, is it nature or nurture? Some people are brilliant, some people have a hard time, you know, with even basic mathematics. Mathematics, tennis, piano. Some people are more gifted than others. But even if you're not gifted at all, if you have reasonable intelligence, you can certainly make some progress in mathematics. You can learn how to play something on piano. You can learn how to hit the ball somewhat in tennis. It's basically the same. Some people like Richard Feynman himself, I doubt very much he had any formal training in lucid dreaming. He was naturally gifted. And then other people say, not only do, not, do I not have any lucid dreams, I don't remember any of my dreams at all. Or I very rarely remember any dream. And from the studies that I've read, every normal person has five to seven dream cycles per night. And so what they're, it's not that they're most likely, in the sense of some, unless there's something suffering from some kind of brain disorder, they are dreaming, but they're forgetting all the dreams, right? And so the short answer is, sure, some people are more gifted than others, but even if one is not gifted, unless one has some kind of a psychological or neurophysiological brain disorder, uh, that it is a, 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 uh, an ability that can be trained. And do you, are, do you do that? I mean, is there a, at your center, for instance, do you, do you have classes in lucid dreaming where you teach people how to do it? I lead retreats. I lead meditation retreats. I, I, like to have, I like to have a captive audience. That is a place that is quiet, that's contemplative, all, everything's taken care of, food and all of that. So people for a week, for example, have nothing else to do except for sit, re receive instruction, and put the instruction to the test of experiment or experience. And so the answer is yes. But I've also had good, good fortune to have a, a long-standing friendship with Stephen LeBerge. He and I were at Stanford together. And he is among the, the most distinguished and accomplished scientific researchers in the field of lucid dreaming. He's a good example. He's naturally gifted. And then when it came time for him to do his doctoral dissertation at Stanford, he wanted to do something innovative. He did it on lucid dreaming because at that time, this was the mid-80s or so, uh, the scientific establishment was on the whole not did not accept the reality of lucid dreams at all. They would say it's a false memory. And so there was no objective evidence, and it's tough, it's tough, isn't it? How do you show objective evidence that you're having a lucid dream? You just come out and say, no, no, you're having a, and the, other, the psychologist would say, if it's a closed-minded one, no, no, I'm sorry, but you're just having a false memory. And you know why? Because you can't be awake and asleep at the same time. And they've just refuted it with logic and not knowing that, of course, you can. So Stephen LeBerge actually came up with the first physical evidence uh, that was quite compelling. And I'll tell you what it is, it's rather interesting. Uh, and that is, he was working there in the dream lab with uh, William Dement, one of the top dream, uh, sleep researchers in the country at the time, his mid-80s. And uh, they had somebody in the lab asleep, 
they're tracking everything, EEG, galvanic skin response, brain, brain states, and so forth. And they're also tracking eye movements. So this, is, this person lying fastest down in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford, and they noticed that his physical eyes were tagging left, right, left, right in a very methodical fashion. Never seen this before. So they woke him up, said, what were you just dreaming about? And I think within one minute you're going to guess. It's either ping pong or tennis, right? <laughs> it was ping pong. He was watching a ping pong match. <laughs> well, lo and behold, they discovered right then, and who saw this coming, that your dream eyes, the eyes in your head inside the dream, which of course are not physical eyes at all, the tracking of your dream eyes corresponds exactly to the movements of your eyeballs in your head of the sleeping person. So move your eyes left in the dream and your eyeballs move left. And so that gave that light bulb, the light bulb went on above Stephen LeBeige's head and he said, I got an idea. Because by that time he'd had maybe a thousand lucid dreams. He could have them pretty much every night he wanted through training. So he said, okay, now I've got, a, I got an experiment we can run that would give you objective evidence that people do have lucid dreams. Nobody who had a lucid dream needed that, but people who don't needed some remedial work. And so what he did was, he went, into, he went, into, into, he went to sleep in the, in the dream lab there, and then as soon as he became, and he told, them, he told them before he went to sleep, when I become lucid, I'm going to move my eyes to the left three times, I'm going to pause, and I move my eyes three times to the left again. In other words, that washes out any kind of statistical, you know, random, random chance. And so he did that, they tracked his, his eyeballs in his head, and that became a scientific paper loose dreaming revealed. And so this is, so I refer to him because he's written a number of very good books and it's not from any kind of religious context at all. Buddhism is very strong in, lucid, in dream yoga and I've written about that, I teach, teach it commonly. Uh, but he approached it from a secular perspective, simply as a scientist, came up with some very ingenious methods that are accessible uh, and gets, helps people start having lucid dreams. And I'll just give you the, the cue. The first thing is increase your dream recall. And, and how you do that? By paying greater attention, and as soon as you wake up, have that be the first thought you have when you wake up. What was your last memory? And start developing dream recall, and the simple reason for that is, if you can't remember your dreams, even if you have a lucid one, you won't remember it. <laughs> That's very funny. So, you, you're using the word lucid. What is the relationship between the word lucid and aware? And are they the same? The term lucid here, I think it's a good choice. In this context, it's not only being aware, it's being aware that you're aware. And that is in a non-lucid dream, you're perfectly aware of the various people, situations, your body, your feelings, and so forth. What you're not aware of is the fact that this is all a dream. You're not aware that you're, you're not, a, yeah, you're just, you're just not aware of things as they are. And so in a similar fashion, uh, when we get caught in a, well, let's say a non-lucid or quasi-lucid quasi stream of thought or rumination, we very often conflate the mental events with the reference of the mental events. So I could be sitting here, rumination tends to be negative by definition. And so I could be thinking here about somebody who ripped me off some years ago and cheated me, was really betrayed my trust, and I can start thinking about that and getting really upset and really making myself, you know, getting some anger and resentment coming up and then I've made myself upset. What I've done here is I've conflated these memories, the images coming to mind with the actual person who did something to me years ago who right now may be feeding her puppy some milk, you know, totally unrelated. But that's not being aware that I'm caught up in thought. And so this is the downside of mind wandering is that we get caught in a semi-conscious flow of thinking very similar to a non-lucid dream. So, so in a sense, when we talk in meditation about how you're trying, when you're focusing on awareness, mm -hmm. you're trying to become aware of your thoughts mm -hmm. to bear witness to those thoughts, right. sort of pop up a level mm -hmm. so that you are thinking about thinking, or at least that's what Marvin often, well, the, 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 the computer people like to use the word thinking, but, yeah. but you become aware of the thinking so that you, and, and then the higher you go, the more you become a witness, right? Mm -hmm. And so is in that sense is, so, so I guess two questions is, what's the relationship between learning how to meditate and learning mm -hmm. how to lucid dream? And also is lucid dreaming similar to the kind of awareness that you're trying to achieve when you're 
meditating? Sure. I mean, the word meditation in Buddhism and many other traditions has tremendous array to it. It's like saying, tell me about the scientific method, right. as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's just an it's uninformed question. Uh, and so there's a wide variety, but if we look at those types of meditation that are, that are really designed to yield insight, to make actual discoveries from the first person perspective, then in that regard, there's definitely a strong parallel to not be deluded, to not, to not be unaware, to not be deluded. And so in the lucid dream, obviously it's going from an, an, an aware state, you're aware of what's in the dream, but you're not aware that it is a dream. And likewise, in terms of the waking state, we're aware of our thoughts and emotions and so forth, but the cognitive fusion tends to take place, and it really is a subjective bias. Because in identifying with thoughts, then we're not aware of them, where the attention is, is riveted off to the referent of the thoughts. And, and it seems like a lot of the... Um non-lucid thinking, so, so there's a lot of work on deception, yeah. and there's a lot of work on self-deception, and, right. and one of the um, papers I read recently that um, I found fascinating is they make you hear voices, some mm -hmm. of them your own, some of them other people's, right. and depending on your sort of psychological position, mm -hmm. you will attribute some of your voice to others, yeah. or conversely other people's voices as your own, mm -hmm. and it seems to have to do with your confidence level and things like that. Uh -huh. But what they do is they measure your galvanic skin response, yeah. which is closer to really tied to your subconscious. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out even if you are unaware uh -huh. of whose voice it is, because you're... you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. Your subconscious knows. Yeah. So, so here's a case where your subconscious knows the truth, mm -hmm. for what, some value of truth, but your conscious is being deceived. Right. Um, and I think that a lot of, and most of maybe our thoughts, are these self-deceptions that we have right. that allow us to have this semblance of confidence in a world where we probably mm -hmm. rationally shouldn't be confident. Mm -hmm. And because you need a certain level of confidence in order to get anything done. Right. And you need to filter in order to get things mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you know, if you were completely aware, we'd all be sitting meditating on a mountain and nothing would get done. I mean, so, so I guess the, 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 the trade-off of being completely aware uh -huh. in, in some people's minds, and I think some of the criticisms, say, of Buddhism as well, uh -huh. if you sit around and you're focused inward all uh -huh. the time, are you uh -huh. actually doing anything? And, and what does doing anything mean? And, and so, so there's two questions, again, tied into this. Is so, mm -hmm. so cause is, is self-deception the thing that's sort of the opposite of lucid and awareness mm -hmm. and then and how important is self-deception for our sanity or our productivity or whatever society and is i mean and i'll ask you the other question later yeah these are they're very very dense and interrelated questions i'll come back to an earlier point that segues right into the mm -hmm. the last set of issues you've raised and that is um again when i was studying cognitive psychology it was just an intro course but i did get introduced to it one mental phenomenon that really struck me for its absence was the term mental perception. We have five modes of perception and then we're speaking about the mind and remembering and kind of basically thinking and all that kind of business. But it's missing something really obvious. And that is when you're having a dream, whether it's lucid or non-lucid, you're not thinking about the people, you're not thinking about the appearances, the sounds and so forth, you're perceiving them. You're perceiving them. You're perceiving the colors in your dream. You're, you're perceiving the sounds that you hear. You're perceiving the emotions that are arising. It's perception. It's not inference. It's not thinking about. It's perception every bit as much as my perceiving the striped color of your shirt, you know? And so the fact that that could be overlooked, I found quite mm -hmm. astonishing. Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, fa a faculty that we ha do have, and it never even got mentioned in the entire textbook. That's bizarre. And it's not only bizarre, but it's important in the sense that we have the five physical senses. And although these can be marvelously, some of them can be marvelously extended with technology, telescope for eyes and so forth and so on, uh, in terms of exercises to improve your sight, can I do some exercise that I can develop my, my vision so I can see with eight power magnification? Or that I can hear like, you know, like a dog or what have you? The answer is no. It's, it's pretty limited. So people can develop, wine connoisseurs develop their, their gustatory sense and so forth, but it is actually limited. When it comes to the sixth sense, and now we're not speaking of something occult or mysterious or paranormal, just our faculty of mental perception, uh, by which we observe dreams, but also thoughts, emotions, mental imagery, and so forth. This out of six modes of perception, this is the one that actually can be refined and extended to extraordinary degrees but only if you sit down and develop methods and, and implement them. So that's what's done in meditation. So there's one point. Now if you can pick up and then segue to the, the second point you've made. Mm -hmm. Right now can you just give me a reminder so I'll link yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, that was an important so, point. So the, the, um, 
so I'll, I'll play it from yours. So, so let's say, okay, I understand that you can, uh, you have a, a method for increasing your awareness right. and your, your, right. uh, your mental uh -huh. ability. But, but, but is, is, so is that something we should all do? And, is, and isn't self-deception necessary uh -huh. to protect ourselves? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I have a belief, but I'm asking this as sort of a, I mean, because sure. it seems like a lot of people may not turn out well if they're aware. Is that true or? Well, just, as, just, just in, at the words themselves, without even thinking about it, self-deception can be helpful in the following ways. Finish this sentence. I can't. <laughs> I just don't think that ignorance is bliss, not for the, not for the long term, short term maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, I just figure deception is not going to be helpful, period. If I deceive you, that's not going to turn out well for you. But, but so let me, let me push back on that because Good. I think, um, let, if, like in normal society, so mm -hmm. if, if, I, if we're at dinner and, and you sure. say, um, I say, how was the food? And you say, oh, um, I, I'm just full. And yeah. we're at a polite company. Yeah. And I say, oh, okay. Instead of what you really thought, which was that it was terrible, yeah. right? But that actually allows the evening to go on without much sure. problem. Sure. And a certain amount of deception, and actually there's, there's, a, there's some studies which are quite interesting. If you mm -hmm. ask people to identify liars on a video, they can't. They can't, but, yes. Mm -hmm. They can't. Cannot. Cannot. But if you ask them to identify those people who are thinking hard, uh -huh. they will pick out the liars. So we have the uh -huh. ability uh -huh. to find liars, but uh -huh. for some reason we haven't developed uh -huh. um, our brain in a way that we tend to find liars because actually we don't like to know about the liars because right. society actually runs better when you're gullible. When you have a bunch of gullible people, as long as you don't have more than a certain percentage mm. of bad actors, it turns yeah. out things are, like, we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have many babies you're if making people didn't have you're deception. Making you know? You're so, making me so, fearful and trembling. Right, but, 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 I mean, but, but this is, so, so, so I'm arguing the, uh -huh. the side of a lot of people who believe that deception is a fundamental piece yeah. of how the brain and society works and yeah. that you can remove it, but what happens when you start to remove it? So, so lawyers and policemen, they tend to be people who train themselves Right. to blast past their self-deception and identify those bad guys. Mm -hmm. They tend to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to not be married for very long. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, there's, there's a whole cost that they pay yeah. for eliminating this field of self-deception, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so obviously if you're, if you're a monk and you're living in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ashram, you, you can afford to be extremely aware. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm sort of arguing against myself because I know I, monks, I can did, tell. But, I can but, tell. but still, but, but there's, a, there's a lot to be said about for people who aren't in the right condition uh -huh. that without self-deception, they're gonna become miserable. It is a very interesting point. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to whisk, whisk off the table the first point. And that is, and that is in, you know, if, if you and I actually go out with a group of friends and we're having dinner at some place you recommended, for example, mm -hmm. and I just don't care for the food, it's not a matter of deception because we, both, we are both courteous, civilized people. So you don't expect me to be bluntly truthful. The food was just awful. Why did you recommend this place? Courteous people don't do that. It's not helpful. At some point when we're not at the table, I might just suggest afterwards, uh, maybe we can give that place a pass next time. And that's enough because you know everything from, my, from that statement. Right, right. So I'm, I think it's not deception. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the rules of courtesy, that there's just some things you don't need to say, but in not saying them, you're not deceiving anybody. Okay. Uh, and this goes for complimenting people on their appearance and so forth, or at least not, you but, know. But, but when you get complimented, I'm sure that the person, even if you're saying it completely to be polite, I'm mm -hmm. sure the recipient thinks it's a little bit more true than you intended. I'm sure there's a could little be. bit of self-deception in there. Be. It could be. It also depends on the relationship. Yeah. Uh, you know, is, is it, I mean, it's a relationship. So there it is. But I think we can move, move on from that. Um, the notion of self-deception. When we're in a, let's go back to a non-lucid dream. Mm -hmm. In a non-lucid dream, you're fundamentally deceived. You're actually, I mean, I think Freud said you're basically in a psychotic state when you're having a non-lucid dream because you got everything wrong. I mean, you don't know that your lifespan is maybe five minutes of this persona in the dream. You don't know the dream's gonna be gone in five minutes and you're gonna be existing nowhere. And so there's self-deception there. It also makes one very vulnerable to suffering through threat from other people. I spoke with a student of mine up in Norway a couple of months back. She was having a very lucid dream and somebody very threatening came to her, to her with a knife. Really very threatening. And she being lucid, she took the man's hand with the knife in it and she plunged it into her abdomen. And then what happened? No, 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 no pain and no fear. 
She's lucid. She's putting a dream knife into a dream abdomen. There's no molecules in the knife, no molecules in the abdomen. And of course, she completely disarmed him by doing the worst thing that he could possibly do to her. She did to himself, to herself. And so, no, I get, I'd have to say that as a matter of principle, I don't think in the long run self-deception is going to be helpful. And you gave me fear and trembling when you said it will be good for society if people are gullible. Well, that's exactly what totalitarian, totalitarian dictatorships are wishing everybody would say. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. If I mislead you, it's for your own good. Trust me. And I will make sure that you don't get any of the information that I, want you, that I don't want you to hear. And that's how you control people, but that's not how you liberate people. Yeah. It makes for a false stability, and sooner or later, so the computer geeks are going to find out every possible loophole that's shutting down the internet. And I think we all know who the countries that we're talking about. So no, it's a, it's a, it's an unstable equilibrium. That's actually the answer I would have given. I, th I, I do think that um, for a certain kind of equilibrium, it's safe, but in the long run, it's not as robust. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like the matrix, green pill, red pill yeah. thing, I think. The I, truth it's, shall it's, make it's, you free but, yeah. is a pretty good aphorism. But, then, but you, make, you made a very, it really touched my heart when you spoke of policemen and other people in that line of work who are there not to be deceived, who are seeing the seedier side, but unfortunately are seeing that relentlessly. They never go out and pick up nice people. They never go to the loving mother and say, we want to take you in for questioning. You know, they only get the... Well, unless they're bad guys. <laughs> unless they're bad guys. Um, but there it is. But you know, this is the point that I don't think we can ever have too much truth. Because the truth, the opposite is ignorance or delusion. And I don't think that either of those in the long term would be helpful. But where meditation comes in is balance. It's very much a matter of balance. And that is, as we're developing our cognitive abilities, we should be also developing our empathetic capacity. And that with that, as we open the heart as well as the mind, then we can start handling more and more truth because the heart is open and we're not seeing, simply seeing good guys, bad guys, my side, your side, but we're seeing more empathetically. So, so, in, in a, so there's a couple layers, but there's a simple question, which is, yeah. um, you know, often I, I talk about the difference between art and design as um, art, is anything as long as it's not useful. And design uh -huh. has to be useful. Same with science and engineering. I think uh -huh. engineering is very focused on having utility, whereas right. science, you're not supposed to ask scientists why they're studying. And when you talk about your work in lucid dreaming and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this work, it sounds a lot like science. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about you know, the Dalai Lama or a lot of the work that um, people do, it's also trying to change society. So there's an impact mm -hmm. element. Um, but uh, often when we talk about bringing religion into academic environments, mm -hmm. um, the somewhat implementation or impact-oriented side of religion is also the one that's viewed as negative because sure. that's often gotten wrong. You sure. know? And so, so I'm, I'm curious how you think about um, you know, the role of Buddhism, the role of meditation, the role of your work, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of its relationship to science and also in terms of are you actually trying to, are you, would you say you're trying to impact the world through outcomes or more impact science through understanding or some combination? The first person I'd like to impact is myself. Uh, so I've spent, I think, something like 30 to 40,000 hours in meditation over the last 44 years. And the aspiration was not that I want to change science or I want to promulgate Buddhism or anything like it. Well, it actually wasn't. Uh, it was really out of an existential aspiration, an inner, inner aspiration to live, actually, very simple. I'd like to live a, a life that is true and meaningful. So I don't want my life to be based on happy delusions because I don't think it's going to be happy in the long term. But I'm not willing to, I'm not capable actually, otherwise I would have followed my career in science, which I was planning from the age of 13. I'm not satisfied. I mean really right from my core, I'm not satisfied simply to be living in, in accordance with a lot of facts. Because there's also the word meaning has meaning. There is a difference between a meaningful life and a meaningless life. And I think we have the capacity to do both or either. And so I want my life to be meaningful, but I also want it to be truthful. So, the, so meditation practice is really designed to do that, to, in terms of our own first person experience. And of course I've studied physics, collaborated extensively with neuroscientists and psychologists. I like to know what's true. And some truths are more easily accessible from a third person scientific perspective, and other truths are more easily accessible in a rigorous, sophisticated fashion from a first person perspective, bringing these together. And so I think the, the more in alignment we are with truth, the greater capacity we have, the greater chance we have of living a happy and a meaningful life. But meaning has to be something more than simply finding a lot of facts. 
And so there it is. The very word meaning, are you living a meaningful life or not, is not a scientific question. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a meaningful question. And it has to be answered outside of the parameters of science just to show their, limit, their limits to science as are to Buddhism. So Buddhism has multiple prongs. I'll make this short because I know our time is short. But there's no question that there are elements of Buddhism that are simply religion. And you look at it and say, but that's what Christians do and Muslims and Taoists and so forth. That's very religious. Robes, ceremonies, beliefs, hierarchy and so forth. There's no question it's there. But there's also when looking in this one particular tradition, Buddhism, it has an en enormously rich philosophical heritage. That's not religion. And if you debate some of the great philosophers of Buddhism, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Dhammakirti, and so forth and so on, you just meet them right on the same playing ground with Kant, with Socrates, with Wittgenstein, and so forth. I mean, that's where they're talking, and there's no holds barred. We're talking reason here, we're looking for empirical evidence, and so it's straight philosophy. And that's been from the beginning. It was not something adopted from outside. But there's this third element that I find most intriguing and most compelling myself, and that is, this, and it's from the beginning, this radically empirical element of Buddhist inquiry that has no technology. The, Buddhist, the whole Buddhist civilization basically didn't develop anything technologically. That's not what their interest was directed. But they did develop something technologically, and that is refining our attention skills and our metacognitive skills, those to a very, very high degree, unmatched in all of Western civilization. And so that's a truly scientific portion of it. So I'm not saying Buddhism is science. I'm saying it has scientific elements. And the interface there, as coming as a Buddhist with a lot of exposure to Western civilization and also including science and philosophy, there's no question in my mind that the Buddhist tradition in the 21st century can be, and really I would love it to be, enriched by modern physics, neuroscience, psychology, and also Western philosophy. It can be enriched, it can continue to evolve. Because over the last 2,500 years, as, as you must know in, in Buddhism, in, in Japan, Japanese Buddhism is very Japanese. Mm -hmm. And Tibetan Buddhism, very Tibetan. And Thai Buddhism is very Thai. And that's what should happen. They're assimilated into the culture. But now Buddhism has gone global. And so can Buddhism continue to adapt, to evolve, almost like a living organism, to this changing environment? and highlight these points of contact with, Western, with, let's say, Western philosophy and Western science or global science. So there's a one way, and that's happening a lot now. But again, when we bracket Buddhism simply as a religion, then we blind ourselves to the fact that in fact, and I will say this as a fact, there are many replicable, very deep, transformative discoveries that have been made by contemplatives who put in 20, 40, 60,000 hours of training like a really good neuroscientist, and they've replicated that among themselves. And so in terms of the fool on the hill, the, the monk or the yogi who goes off into solitude, because that's the final point and I'll address that briefly. Um, in fact, one can say, well, what about Einstein? What did he actually ever produce? When he was offered a job, I just, I just uh, you know, read his, the marvelous uh, biography, the recent one by, uh, 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 I won't even try to get his name, but it was a wonderful one, the one, the one just recently written. But the point being that when he was offered a position, I think it was University of Berlin, he was asked, well, Professor Einstein, what kind of equipment, what kind of lab do you want? And he said, well, pad, pad of paper, a pencil, and a big waste paper basket for all my mistakes. <laughs> you know? So what good is he? this funny-haired looking man sitting in his, in, his, in his room coming up with equations after equations after equations, and that's all he does. He's come up with a bunch of theories. Uh, we can say he was pretty useless. He wasn't that great a dad or a husband because he was so much this, you know? But it, the practical, practical applications, both of quantum mechanics and relativity theory, cannot be measured. But it's not quite the same for a contemplative, and I've known some who's gone to, for 20, 30 years in solitude. What are they doing? They're not just sitting there being aware of the present moment, which is nice, but it's an enormously more sophisticated than that. There are different ways of phrasing it, but here's one way that is not wrong. And that is these people, if their motivation is authentic, and it actually can be altruistic, they're going in so they can come out and be of much greater service than they could have when they went in. What they're doing is single-mindedly seeking to cultivate exceptional degrees of sanity. And that means heightened awareness of all kinds, of the environment, of their own mental states and so forth, heightened awareness in dreams, heightened awareness in dreamless sleep, where they're taking this implicit awareness, which is there when you're deep asleep, and making it explicit. But they're also cultivating the heart. They're cultivating compassion, empathy, loving kindness. And so that when they do come out, they will come out as bearers of light, rather than being, simply being more part of the problem. So if you look at medical training, for example, six, eight years of being a pretty useless human being, I think. I mean, if you're a spouse, you're not much of a spouse. If you're a parent, you're kind of a part-time parent. 
So for six, eight years, you say, what a waste of air you are, eating all that food, just producing all these waste products. What have you done? And the answer is six, eight years, not much. But when you come out, can you be of greater service than you, than you could when you came in? And if, a yogi can, if that's not true for the yogi, if the yogi has not undergone some meaningful transformation so that he or she is able to be of much greater service than going in, then that was a waste of time. Now, and, and on this point, there are hedonic and eudaimonic benefits. And hedonic is for our material well-being, for our good health, for education, for productivity in the world, for technology, and all of this. And so science has been a terrific success, science and technology, a terrific success. Science providing the knowledge, technology finding the ap practical applications for that knowledge. So here we are, you know, so I didn't have to walk from California to here and all of that. No many needs to talk about it. But it is hedonic. And that is for all the growth of science and technology, are we living more meaningful lives now than we did at the time of Copernicus? I think it'd be a tough sell. Okay. But no, more knowledge, yes. But one of the great ironies, and I think it's kind of an enigma of the 20th century, is there was a century in all of human history when we learned more in one century, quite possibly, than all the preceding centuries combined. The 20th century was quite remarkable. Growth of science and technology, absolutely without parallel. And then we should pause. The 20th century, the time when there was the greatest inhumanity of man against man in the whole of human history, the greatest environmental degradation in the whole of human history, and the wiping out of more species, other species, than the whole of human history. So we knew more, but we're being suicidal. And that tendency is not slowing down in the 21st century. So facts, yes, meaning no. Facts, yes, ethics, no. Facts, yes, compassion and larger wisdom, no. And so since science is not producing the goods there, and it was never designed to do so, we just have to recognize, I believe, what are the limits here? It's not to put it down, it's just what are the limits? Science is not making us more compassionate, ethical, or wise. It wasn't designed to do so. So step outside, and are, other, are there other types of discipline, other ways of viewing reality that can give us this, a greater long-term vision of wisdom, of meaning, and so forth. And so that's why one engages in contemplative practice, that you withdraw temporarily with the anticipation, and it may be your motivation from the first moment. I'm withdrawing for a time being. I'm gonna be useless for a while, so that when I come back, I can be of much greater benefit. If you look in the rev revolutions throughout history, the Bol Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution, and so many others, the people who are revolting are carrying within themselves the same problems of the people they're revolting against. So out with the Tsar and in with the Bolsheviks, out with the Tsar, in with Stalin. Exactly where was that progress? And so that's why before we try to initiate a revolution, it might be good to initiate it internally. So I have a lot of other questions, but that was a very good place, I think, to pivot to any questions from the audience. Um, shout, shout, do we have a mic? And social media people, if there's any Twitter stuff. And Hi, I'm Xiao Xiao, PhD student in Tangible Media Group. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little about the role of artistic practices in tapping into uh, other uh, experience of consciousness. So I'm a pianist myself, and I study a lot into it, and there's uh, stories that encounter of pianists, for instance, uh, Arthur Rubinstein, who discusses how when he's performing on stage, he can actually sense the person in the audience who's listening the most closely, and he plays just for this person. Um, and another thought that's kind of related to this is that you talk about the dichotomy of science and meditative practices, but I actually feel like you can see it as a sort of tripod where the science, arts, and spiritual practices are all ways of finding and articulating different sorts of truth, where they constitute different things as truth, but they also have different ways of expressing the truth. Uh -huh. And um, a final sort of related thought is um, about, um, so both science and the arts Arts have products, results that you make, sure. either as ideas, experiences, or objects in the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like meditative practices are, are sort of more focused on cultivating the internal state rather than having an external product. And perhaps that's maybe a reason why in, in the values of our transactional world, it's hard mm -hmm. to uh, reconcile the... Mm -hmm. the acting over thinking aspect of it. So mm -hmm. I don't know, comment on any of that, <laughs> but especially parts about the arts, because that's sure. what- Sure, no, it's a very interesting bouquet of questions and themes you raised. 
First of all, I agree with everything you said. And that is not just science and meditation. I, I never thought of those as kind of somehow being an exclusive uh, set of categories that, okay, now we covered everything, science and meditation. So it's clearly not true. And so the artistic element is a very interesting one. And let me just make this connection. Uh, when you're in a, in a lucid dream, when you're in a lucid dream, then you're aware of the fact that everything you're experiencing is a free creation of your own mind. In other words, it is a work of art, good, bad, good art, bad art, but it is still, it's a free creation, and it's a spontaneous, immediate creation of your own mind, whereas you, you don't have to put it on canvas or in stone or in, in anything else, and like, as with music also. So there you are as an artist already. You, one of the first things you discover in a lucid dream is how malleable it is. That is, you can start to shift it, you can shape it, you can, you can ship, shape shift yourself in the dream. From a human being, to a di you can go to another gender, you can go to another species, and so forth. So there is a work of art in progress if you're lucid. Now if you're not lucid, then it's just happening to you. It's not art, it's just something happening to you, and you're basically the victim of it. Uh, but there is, a, there is an expression of art, internal art. It would be, it'd be wonderful if one, if one day they could find some brain hookup, you actually display that for everybody else to see. I don't see that coming soon. Um, I think there's a reciprocal relationship here between artistic creativity and meditation. And that is through artistic inquiry, through uh, just simply the, the creation of art, can this give insight into nature of mind, the luminous aspect of the mind, and other aspects of reality? I have no question about that at all. Definitely yes. Here's something I found from my own meditation. And that is when I engage in this type of practice I alluded to very earlier, fairly briefly. And that is just resting the awareness in its own state, just being clear and cognizant, not thinking about anything, simply being present, and then observing thoughts, images, memories, and so forth, simply arising and passing, rising and passing. In so doing, what I found, especially if I do it for many hours a day, for days on end, is that it taps into, the, just, the, the awareness kind of settles. It begins to descend, so to speak. And of course, I'm speaking a bit metaphorically. It descends into a, a deeper dimension of awareness that is not so caught up, not so crystallized. When I was studying advanced mechanics, studying calculus, when I was studying Sanskrit at the same time, I'm caught up in, in a mesh of very complex conceptual constructs. And there's a certain rigidity in that. When you're working on an advanced mechanics problem, that's not exactly fluid. You need to take it step by step by step. When I was working through Sanskrit grammar, it's very orderly, it's very, it's kind of locked in, right? And so there's a value in that, it's ana analytical thinking, you're going from here to there, here to there. But when you soften up, you loosen up, you melt your awareness into a state that's not verbalized, not locked into conceptualization, you go into a kind of a state of awareness, I say it's like plasma-like, plasma-like, and then it's not already crystallized, it's not formed, it's like a plenum of creativity. And you, you release into that, and then sparks, like, almost like arcs, of creativity come. So my, my gift is not for visual art so much, but I have gifts in other areas, a little bit in music and then philosophy and so forth. And what I found again and again when I would do that is when I'd settle and I'd release, then like having two, two electric rods and seeing an arc, electricity going from one to one, connections would be arising spontaneously when I'm in that kind of fluid state. So my creativity went for my, where my gifts are. If it were you, I would imagine, I would speculate, when you rest in a similar, similar state, that the arcs of creativity will be in the area you are gifted in. And so your art, may, your, art your artistic endeavors, may illuminate that dimension of consciousness, but by slipping into that dimension of consciousness, this can also give rise to great creativity in the arts, in music, in mathematics, in science. Einstein himself said, for his own creativity, and he was rather a creative individual, that he was also very good in introspection. He had a very clear sense of where his ideas were coming from. And he commented, I paraphrase, that the, the spark, the creativity, the initial insight was not articulate. It was not in concepts or words. It was something prior to that. It rose up, came to his consciousness, and then he had to struggle to find the words for it, let alone the mathematics for it. But that came, that was derivative, and the insight was something on a more primal level, and I, I would suggest it's coming from that deeper dimension, and his, of course, occurred where he was gifted. So I see this all as an interplay, and if we look into classical Indian civilization, where, kind of in, in its golden era, and um, this was something like 1,500 years ago, something, on that, something like that, 
Then you had these great monastic universities in India, like Nalandra, Nalanda, which the Dalai Lama speaks of very often, and they had as a kind of a matrix of knowledge, very much unlike modern universities, which are just d disciplines all over the place, and often with not much whole lot of relationship, and often, unfortunately, not a whole lot of dialogue either. Everybody encapsulated in their own walls, you know? But in classical India, you had five fields of knowledge. I'll be really quick here, but I think it's interesting. You had the central knowledge was simply called inner knowledge. Inner knowledge. They considered the most central type of knowledge for human beings to aspire to is the nature of our own minds. Know that, because that's the center of your, that's the center of your world, your mind, your presence. That is in the center of your world. Look in all directions, you know who's in the center. And so understand your own mind. And then we care about our suffering, we care about the suffering of others, we care about our joys and happiness, and so through this inner knowledge to identify through very careful investigation, what are the true causes of suffering? It's not just other people, they may catalyze, it may not. What are the true causes of suffering? They're to be found within. What are the true causes of happiness? Also be, be, to be found within. So a very, very in-depth, textured, multi-layered, multi-perspectival approach to studying the mind, fathoming the mind and consciousness itself. But then you have four derivative fields of knowledge. One of these is medicine. So a person may meditate a great deal and then manifest whatever insight, studying medicine, and that creativity will flow out into medicine. That's one. Another one is simply called the, the, the knowledge of, of, of making. So this breaks down the division between art and technology because it could be making a mandala, it could be making a bridge, or a pot, or a painting. It's making, it's creativity. And so your meditation may flower in creativity. It may flower in, the third one was logic, clear thinking, so that could be mathematical thinking as well as qualitative philosophical thinking. That was the third one. And the fourth one is a kind of a mysterious one, it's called the knowledge of sound. And that has to do with grammar, but also has to do with music and sound in general. That was a whole discipline in and of itself. But the idea, you come into the center, you come into depth, you try to really fathom the nature of your mind, tap into the wellsprings of creativity, and then depending on your inclinations, predispositions, gifts, talents, then the creativity will flow out into one or more of those secondary fields of knowledge. But then they all flow into the center as well. So it's like a fountain, four fountains flowing into one, one, fount one fountain flowing into the other four. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question, and there's one from Twitter, so I'll have Stacy. Is it on? Oh, now it's on. Um, this is a question from Kiolu Fox, who sent this in from Seattle. So, could you speak to the validity of intersubjectivity as a collective consciousness? Is there science behind this? The collective unconsciousness as uh, posited by Jung? I don't know that there's any, I don't, I don't know of any uh, rigorous science that would corroborate that belief. Uh, it's an interesting hypothesis. I know Jung had his own, I'm presuming the reference here is to Jung's notion of the collective unconscious. Uh, I don't know of any very rigorous studies that have been done of it. At the same time, I don't dismiss it. Number one, not all, all my truths are validated by science. For example, the fact that I have consciousness at all, that's not validated by science, but I'm very aware that it's true. Uh, a collective unconscious, I think Jung approached that by way of the archetypal forms that appear in dreams uh, and so forth. Uh, in that regard, is there a sub-layer? Is there something shared? I like the word intersubjective a lot. I think it has enormous implications and reality to it, that we not only are individual streams of consciousness, but our consciousnesses are entangled in very meaningful ways, especially when there's a group endeavor, a group of mathematicians, a group of, med a group of meditators, a, a, the Society for Neuroscience. That's definitely a lot of collective consciousness taking place there. And so, how deep does it go? I think it can be researched, it should be researched, but I'm not sure it can be researched effectively by looking outside, by studying brains and behavior. If it can be researched, I think it will be by turning inwards in a very professional, sophisticated fashion, probing through the, the layers and layers of our psyche, which are individuated, rising dependence upon brain, acculturation, language, personal history, and so forth, penetrating through that. And that can be done. It's a lot of hard work, uh, sitting quietly and meditating. But if one penetrates through this individuated, conditioned consciousness of our own individual mind streams, can one tap into a dimension of consciousness that is intersubjective? My answer is yes. Can that be demonstrated scientifically? 
I would say not if you exclude the meditators. If you're just studying a, a brain and behavior and interviewing people, I don't think so. But my dream here, and I'll end on this note, is I'm actually in the process of creating, or helping to create, I can't do it by myself, a network of what I call contemplative research facilities. Contemplative research facilities. Where, and there's nothing like it on the world, in the world right now. Where we bring together highly qualified, well-trained neuroscientists, psychologists, even physicists, potentially people from other branches, including the arts, bringing them in with one criterion, be, please be open-minded, that's all we ask, but we're not asking you to adopt any belief system, but bring in the same facility people who are looking for training in contemplative practice or who people are highly trained and have this be a training facility and a research facility. So when people will put in five, 10, 15,000 hours of very rigorous contemplative training, but they'll be monitored by psychologists, by neuroscientists, watching what's happening in their brain. How is it manifesting your behavior? Is this good for you? If you spend 5,000 hours of solitude, does that make you kind of a weirdo? Does it make you a, a, a damaged human being, or is it actually healthy? The scientists get help there. So having in one facility, places where open-minded contemplatives, who are not dogma-bound by any religion, but open-minded, really wanting to know it's true, in the same place, the same facility, as well-trained scientists, and with a spirit of interdisciplinary, cross-cultural, mutual respect, wishing to learn from each other, I think in that way, with that kind of vision, uh, we can have a much richer multidimensional understanding of, of the mind and consciousness than the contemplatives on their own can come up with, with no brain science or behavioral science, and, or the scientists can come up with, with no rigorous training and introspection. So I think that's a way of the future, and I'm basically investing the rest of my life to try to make that happen. That was perfect you're, you're um, ending, because I think, um, you know, the, the spirit of the media lab, we, we use the word anti-disciplinary, which is mm. things that don't fit in traditional disciplines yeah. either because they're in between or they're beyond the disciplines. And I think the work that you're doing and the fact that you're approaching it in such a scientific way, trying to bring the, um, you know, the, and, and traditionally science and, and those, um, they, they poked each other, but yeah. not very productively. And I think that it's, it's really fertile ground whether we're talking about neuroscience or, or wellness. So mm -hmm. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. And I hope that we can connect somehow with your research network as you develop. I'd love to. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank, thank you very much. For me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.